Marquetta stock, MQ is the ticker, recently went public. They have some fantastic growth figures, and they enable some of the fastest growing industries in the world. So the stock did recently go public. The stock really hasn't gone really anywhere since it went public. You know, it's sort of languishing, trading in a range. And so I wanted to visit it to see if it should be part of my personal investment journey and to share what do I think my up, you know, what do you think the upside could potentially be for Marketa? And hey, what do they even do in the first place? So let's dive right in in this video. My name is Daniel. You're watching Unrivaled Investing, a no hype mission focused channel trying to find you exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. Let's dive right in to understand this setup with Marketa MQ being the ticker. And so here's a disclaimer, which you can read on your own time. And so Marketa MQ stock directly integrates with the legacy card network, credit card network, to offer pioneering companies a modern card issuing platform. That's the phrase they say over and over again, modern card issuing platform. This includes physical or virtual cards, tokenization, and next generation card management functionality. Okay, so there's a lot of like phrases here, but what does this actually mean? So they're rapidly launching new initiatives with a wide range of functionality that's effectively enabling our fastest growing industries. Think food delivery or digital banking, e-commerce, buy now, pay later, cryptocurrency related, car, you know, debit cards, better expense management and reimbursement for gig workers in the gig economy. So a lot of functionality here that's enabling super fast growing industries, industries that in all honesty, you know, 10, 15 years ago, weren't nearly as significant as they are today, being enabled by players like Marketa. And let's, let's, you know, dive a little bit further to understand that. So for example, they, they partnered with DoorDash or DoorDash partnered with Marketa, where for every new Dasher, they get a red card. So the equivalent of a a credit card to purchase food from restaurants when they go to the restaurants to buy it to pick it up on behalf of the customers that ordered using the DoorDash platform. So no, Marketa enables the quick issuance of cards so that the Dashers can start working ASAP. And this allows the door allows DoorDash to track the purchases in real time, preventing fraud. Let's say the Dasher wants to buy something for themselves, approving orders, making sure, oh, this is the correct amount. This makes sense. We're going to approve this order. While also, also because it's all directly integrated, they can directly ping the end customers when their order has been picked up and paid for. So you could see how here it is. Marketa is, is the type of business that's enabling DoorDash. And they're not just enabling food delivery. Marketa is also enabling digital banking for the likes of Square, buy now, pay later functionality for customers like Klarna, Affirm, and Sezzle. These are all buy now, pay later platforms. They also have the Coinbase debit card. So, in, you know, partnering with Coinbase to offer this debit card for customers looking to buy using their crypto wallet various different crypto assets. Just earlier today, the stock did ramp a little bit higher, partly on this news where they announced a partnership with Uber Freight. So that, so and they, they, just, they, they called this out in the press release so that they can pay carriers significantly faster than the industry standard at no additional cost. Rather than waiting 30 days or longer, carriers on Uber Freight can get paid two hours after approved proof of delivery, a 99.7% reduction in wait time. Now, just think of this. Think of the effectively this contractor economy where gig workers or these contractors will get paid in 30 days. And that that is just brutal. Here it is to say, hey, yeah, you work for us and you can get paid in two hours after you've proven that you've you've you know, you've done the delivery. That's amazing. And so, yeah, who, who do you think is going to win in a hyper competitive industry like that? Yeah, a company like Uber Freight, I would imagine, would win with this type of setup. So when you think of that, oh, okay, well, Uber Freight now has a leg over, let's say, other freight you know, solutions in a hyper competitive market because they're partnering with Marketa. Therefore, Marketa starts having real competitive advantages. Think of like a switching cost advantage where like there's no way Uber Freight, if they quickly grow their business because of this type of functionality that creates a win-win with their end contractors, the end carriers, yeah, they're going to be stuck with Marketa for, for, for a long period of time. And you start thinking about this functionality and then you say, well, wait a second, this is functionality that Marketa has for Uber Freight. Maybe this becomes a solution that gets more broadly accepted in the industry. And so then you start thinking, oh, okay, so this might actually potentially have some sort of networking effect as well. So you start thinking about all these types of potential competitive advantages that Marketa has over time that makes it a very compelling business, a business with a strong value proposition. 
With Marquette's strong value proposition, it's not surprising to see them growing very quickly with best-in-class metrics like 200% dollar-based net re- revenue retention and 100% net revenue growth. So these these metrics were for 2020. Effectively saying 200% plus net revenue retention says all of our customers at the start of the year, if you look at all of our customers at the start of the year, you factor in those that leave us the attrition, that cohort spent in effectively 100% more. So if it were a 100% net revenue retention, that means the business is flat. 200 means the business effectively doubled. So this means they're partnering with these businesses as they grow and they benefit from them. They also operate with a usage-based business model, as I was just alluding to, where the more transaction processing volume that goes across their platform, and you know, they talk about how in, in 2020 it was around $60 billion and it's subsequently grown significantly from there, the more processing volume that goes across their platform, and this is what really what drives most of their revenue, the more interchange fees and revenue they'll end up getting. It's also worth calling out that they also share a portion of their fees with their customers as an incentive for doing business and issuing more cards. So say, hey, thanks for doing business with you. This, this, this encourages you to make sure you continue issuing cards with us. Now, you know, I, I've sort of scratched the surface on why Marquette is potentially has a very strong value proposition, why they're growing so quickly, what exactly they do. But what about their valuation? Is it potentially an attractive risk reward? First, I'm going to do a quick plug where if this is your first time tuning in, once again, my name is Daniel. You're watching Unrivaled Investing. If you're interested in following along with my personal financial journey, go to unrivaledinvesting.com where each month I call out a potential multi-bagger as well as my portfolio update. We also have an exclusive community dedicated to learning and trying to find exceptional companies on Discord. I interact on Discord almost on a daily basis. So once again, if you're interested, go to unrivalinvesting.com, click join the journey. And if you enjoy learning about potential multibaggers on this channel, please make a point of hitting that subscribe button. So, you know, I looking at this, you know, in terms of thinking about the valuation, I, there's first a couple of questions or, you know, comments that I need to call out just in, in order to think about where where we can end up with valuation. So the first thought process is looking at, you know, this prior comment about this 200% net revenue retention. That that sounds amazing. That's not, that that is the best figure I think I've seen for net revenue retention. By far the best. Once again, this implies their existing cohorts grew by 100% in 2020. Now their revenue only grew by 100% in 2020. So was their growth entirely from existing cohorts, does this mean that new customers really didn't drive revenue at all for them in 2020? It's it's sort of a weird aspect to the business model that I'd want to understand in greater detail. And that sort of feeds into this next point, which is a legitimate concern, in my opinion, where they call out in the prospectus how they have a huge customer concentration risk with Square, representing over 70% of their recent revenue. So, and, and keep in mind, Square does, you know, have uh, contracts with Marketa MQ stock going through 2024 for various different products like the Cash App, where the contract expires in March 2024, or Square Card, which, you know, expires in December 2024. So you do have these agreements that go out for a few years. But I'm looking at this and thinking, wow, 70% of your business is through one counterparty. That does make this much tougher to invest in. That does significantly increase sort of the blow-up risk here. It makes me think either there's potential M&A activity or it's just super tough. Like, it's hard to get a premium multiple unless you're able to diversify your revenue significantly, you know, your your customer concentration revenue significantly. And so looking at, you know, the valuation currently around 32 bucks a share, management is guiding to around 38% growth for the third quarter. And year to date, they've grown closer to 95%. So I'm assuming a range of 70 to 80%. Maybe they're sandbagging that 38% figure. We'll see. You know, look, 70 to 80% growth is still very attractive. Um, it is, you know, a slight deceleration from their 100% growth the prior year. Uh, their gross margin profile is also lower 
than let's say traditional software companies where you might be looking at 80 to 90 percent gross margins here it is their their gross margin profile is closer to like 40 to 45 um, as they have significant operating costs tied to interchange fees and the effectively the legacy card network where i don't think they'll be able to get a lot of scale over time management pretty much has confirmed this saying like look our long-term margin targets for gross margin is 40 to 45 percent so i'm thinking you know okay so if if you're going to be making 40 to 45 cents for every dollar in revenue how much can you actually make in operating profits because you're going to have r d and you're going to want to launch new things so you know i'm thinking maybe you can get to 15 to 20 percent operating margins keep in mind they're they're nowhere near that right now they're they're operating at an unprofitable gap accounting basis but maybe they can get to 15 to 20 percent operating margins over time. You know, let's let's keep going and say, OK, let's assume because they're riding so many hyper growth waves like e-commerce, buy now, pay later, uh, crypto cards, etc. Maybe they can grow this business at 50 to 70 percent annualized over the next five years. That is exceptional growth. So I'm, I'm saying, hey, let's give full credit for their margins potential they're nowhere near this right now let's give full credit for their growth potential 70 percent annualized for five years is that would put them in like the top one percent in terms of growth for five years that would just be amazing but i don't really give them crazy and multiples five years from now largely because that that square customer concentration risk i mean like unless they're able to diversify significantly then that that might warrant a even higher multiple but i'm thinking 25 to 35 times earnings five years from now based on giving them full credit for these margins and that sort of gets you to downside of 35 percent upside 140 and keep in mind this is just a sort of a hypothetical framework focusing on the upside if they don't execute or you know square leaves them the downside would be way worse than this i'm just sort of thinking okay what are investors potentially playing for you know maybe you could argue there's even more upside if you were to give them a fuller multiple because you assume some square you know diversification in the years ahead that's sort of tough just because you haven't really seen it play out so far you know i i personally i look at this and i'm like wow this is this is a really interesting company i'm impressed with their figures i'm impressed by their growth i'm impressed by the businesses that they're enabling i think the whole finance space is set to have several really interesting developments in the years ahead i know in the crypto space you sort of have DeFi that's trying to change you know how things work and i'm curious if that could ultimately impact significantly the legacy card network sort of business model but so far this seems to be gaining market share growing way faster than let's say the traditional you know payment network like visa or mastercard you see what they're growing at you know maybe growing around 10 percent. you look at something like this and it's growing the payment volume off their platform is growing like 70 percent plus so you look at this okay this is clearly resonating this clearly has strong value proposition i talked about their competitive advantages uh the question is well what's the right price I'm looking at this and I'm not, I'm just not quite sold on it looking at it, uh, you know, looking at something that's effectively trading at a mid 30s times price to sales uh, with significant customer concentration risk. You know, I personally think there are easier potential multi baggers out there. I just recently called out my October potential multi bagger company I own stock in, trades at, you know, under 0.7 times price to book value. I think it can compound book value at, let's say, 10 to 15% in the years ahead. You get a re rating and you get the potential for, let's say, 200 to 300% upside over time. So that's what I called out exclusively for my unrivaled investing journey subscribers. So if this video has been helpful for you, thinking about Marketa in terms of their business model, what's the risk reward, you know, thinking about this, if this has been helpful, please make a point of hitting that thumbs up, hitting that subscribe button. Thanks so much for watching.